welcome to the first in the series of three webinars about national bioinformatics communities in Elixir. Uh, the first one this morning is focused on opportunities for collaboration and funding. And the purpose of these events is really about trying to help to connect the Romanian research community to the activities in Elixir. Um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context to these events before I start talking you through the agenda for the first one. So I'm Andrew Smith, I'm Head of External Relations at Elixir, and I'll be chairing this webinar this morning. Um, the purpose of it really is to help to make sure that scientists in Romania are aware of what Elixir is, um, bec because we would like Romania to join and become a member of Elixir. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that the Romanian research community knows about the opportunities for collaboration, the services that Elixir offers, which you can access right now, even if Romania never becomes a member as well. So that's really the purpose of, the, of these webinars. When we'd started to plan these events, which are done in, in um, collaboration with the Romanian Society for Bioinformatics, so they're, they're joint events between Elixir and RSBI, and when we first started planning these events over a year ago with Bogdan and, and other colleagues, then we originally planned a face-to-face -face meeting. But obviously, given the situation, we needed to switch to a series of online events. And so that's the, 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 the purpose of, of these events, uh, awareness raising, and to give you an opportunity to find out more about what Elixir is, how you can take part, how you can benefit, and also to ask questions from the various experts across Elixir that will be speaking to you over these three events. I'm going to go into one or two housekeeping points before I start my own introduction to what Elixir is. So firstly, I just want to summarize the agenda to you. So I'll start in a moment by giving you an overview of the structure and opportunities in Elixir through membership. Then um, we're delighted to confirm that we have Yulia Mihail, who's a senior counsellor at the Romanian Ministry of Education, who will give a presentation to you after the first talk about um, the Romanian position towards the S3 roadmap and what its current priorities are. Then Balint Balint from Elixir Hungary will give a presentation about the Hungarian node and about the training opportunities in Elixir. We'll then take a short break before you'll hear from Andre Hradil from Elixir Czech Republic, who's an expert in accessing structural funds, which many nodes can use to help to, to pay for scientific activities. And then after that, Jerry Lanfier, Elixir's CTO, will talk to you about all of the ways that you can collaborate with Elixir, use services, engage in the community and focus group activities as well. And then we'll finish with a talk from Horia Banchu, about the Romanian Society for Bioinformatics. So the initiative that we're doing this event jointly with, and that will give you more information about what's happening locally to coordinate the Romanian bioinformatics um, um, community there. And then we'll also have an open discussion as well. So we do want the event to be um, interactive. So there's lots of opportunities to ask questions. The first thing I need to remind you is that this webinar is being recorded. So it will be recorded um, for those of you who don't know how Zoom works, you'll see a control panel um, at the bottom of your screen. And if you want to ask questions, and we encourage you to do so, please click the Q&A function, and then you can write your question in, and then we'll monitor those questions from the Elixir Hub. And then at the end of each talk, um, we'll try and, try and answer one or two of those questions. And at the same time, you can also use the raise your hand function as well um, at the end of the discussion. And then I'll try and introduce one or two raised hands so they can, they can ask the question as well. There is a chat function, but please don't use that for questions. Use that if you need to share links, for example, because we'll be monitoring the raise hand and the Q&A function to make sure that we can answer those questions. Um, and then the other thing is if you want to follow live the slides that are presented in the webinar, then there's a link in this slide where you can get access to them from the Google Drive. And of course, we'll make, make available the slides at the end of the presentation as well. So this is the first in a series of three. The next one takes place on the 29th of September, same time. And that has a focus on human genomics and translational data, which is one of the strengths of Romania. And we'll tell you there about all of the opportunities for engagement with Elixir. And then the final event is the same time, but on the 6th of October, and, the, and that has a focus on plant sciences. It's another area of strength of Romania, where there's also lots of activities taking place in Elixir. 
So we hope that you're able to join all three of these events. And if you haven't registered yet, then please follow the link via this, um, please follow the, follow the link here so that you can register for the second and third webinars. So what I wanted to do to begin with was just to tell you a little bit more about the context to Elixir and some of the opportunities for engagement as a member in Elixir. So first of all, if you don't know what Elixir is, it's basically an intergovernmental organization that aims to coordinate, integrate, and help to sustain life science resources. And they include things like databases, so resources where you can deposit data, or um, also curated databases where you can get data from them. It includes software tools, um, analysis tools and workflows, also training materials, so physical courses, as well as virtual online materials, resources to make data interoperable and fair, as well as national computing facilities to help you analyze the data. And then also increasingly more Elixir nodes provide local data management support to projects and communities as well. So across those services, of which there are hundreds and hundreds of them, we want to really try and coordinate them and integrate them so that there's a single infrastructure that researchers anywhere in the world can access be it in Romania or, or in an Elixir member state or internationally. And all of these services, apart from some compute facilities, are available for free of charge as well. That's one of the other important things to know. So that's the purpose of Elixir. Elixir has um, been around for over 10 years now, and it developed from the S3 roadmap. And I won't spend too much time talking about this because in a moment, Yulia will give you more information on the S3 process and Romania's position towards it. But Elixir first started in, in 2006 when it was added to the original S3 roadmap. So we're reasonably mature now. And since then, um, we're now classed as a landmark research infrastructure, which means that we've made very good progress and we're considered by, the, by S3 to be performing very well. Um, by being on the S3 roadmap, this gives you a good opportunity of speaking to ministries of science in many countries to try and encourage them to join. And with Elixir, we're one of the largest S3 research infrastructures. In fact, in the life sciences, we're the largest. So we have the most number of countries that are, that are members. And you can see a list of them here. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what these countries are doing and how they benefit from Elixir in a moment. There's one or two other countries that we're working with, which we expect to become members over the coming weeks as well, uh, over the coming uh, years as well. So, but, but at the moment, we have um, a large number of countries. And within that, we have over 220 institutes and over 700 scientists and bioinformaticians that are actively working on running those services that I mentioned earlier. One of the themes of these events is really about trying to show what national infrastructures look like, because Elixir is really about trying to help facilitate national data infrastructures for life science in each country, and then helping to connect them together across Europe. And so if Romania becomes a member of Elixir, um, as all of these other countries have, then it would need to create an Elixir node where it would formalize and bring together all of the major players in bioinformatics and then take part in Elixir's activities. And most of these national nodes are distributed entities where they bring together maybe five or 10 scientific institutes in that country. One university or scientific institute will lead that effort and they will sign an agreement with the Elixir hub, which allows us to transfer budget to that community for them to work on projects, which I'll mention in a moment as well. And one of the other things to bear in mind is that um, nodes themselves can expand over time. They can include new members, new areas of science that they want to cover as well. And I've put on this, on this image an example of some of the nodes that you'll hear about. So Balint will introduce you to Elixir Hungary in a moment. Andre will introduce you to Elixir Czech Republic. And so they are examples of nodes that before Elixir started, the community was quite fragmented, the bioinformatics community. And so as a result of being part of Elixir, they've helped to coordinate and coalesce and also get national and EU structural funds to run their activities as well. 
So they're good examples of how before joining Elixir, the community was fragmented and now they come together to work on joint projects with other partners. Some of the other institutes like Emble EBI and the Swiss Institute for Bioinformatics, they already pre-existed. So they've been there for much longer than Elixir and they're single institutes um, that had been around for a long time. And we helped to connect experts from Elixir nodes to those institutions as well. And then at the bottom of the image, you can see Denby, the German node of Elixir, and IFB, the French node of Elixir. And these are other examples of nodes that didn't exist before Elixir started, but they use their own branding. So Denby, for example, has a 50 million euro grant from the German funding agency. IFB in France has had a 20 million euro grant from the French government to coordinate national bioinformatics infrastructures. And we obviously want to continue to help Elixir nodes and national communities do this through their engagement in Elixir. Um, Jerry will come back in more detail later to talk about the technical structure in terms of the, the scientific activities in Elixir. But just so very briefly to mention that in those Elixir nodes, the scientists that are involved in those, in those um, activities are brought together and then we connect them through these platforms and communities. And so in, in later after the break, Jerry will talk to you in much more detail about the opportunities for engaging in these scientific domains that we have in Elixir. One of the ways in which we connect national experts and bioinformaticians across Elixir are through commission services. So we have um, national funding um, that, that, that is, uh, we have national funding that is provided to the Elixir hub, which goes on our technical budget. And then through that, we will commit these scientific projects that help to connect different databases or different resources together. And that's one of the main benefits and interests that scientists have in becoming a member of Elixir. We have um, over 50 projects that we finished and we've currently got 35 that are ongoing and you can get a list of them here. And they range from projects from rare diseases through to um, marine metagenomics. And really the purpose of them is to help to integrate those resources that I mentioned earlier. So there's a project, for example, um, on helping to um, build up expertise to annotate some of the genomes in Ensemble. So that's a resource run by EBI in Cambridge, but some of the expertise sits in Norway and Sweden. And so through that project, we've been able to connect those communities together. Another example is a project between Elixir Germany and EBI about mining the proteome. So Germany has been making lots of big investments in proteomics facilities. But the main database to store proteomics data is Pride, which is run by EBI. And so that project has helped to facilitate data transfer from Germany to, to EBI. So that gives you an idea about these types of projects that we have within Elixir. And on the image here, this is a way of showing you all of the connections that are made between the bioinformaticians in Elixir member states through these projects. So you can see, for example, in Sweden, Netherlands and Finland, how many connections with other bioinformaticians in different countries come about through their engagement in these commission service projects. And it's quite substantial. That's one of the main benefits that communities have from engagement in Elixir. We also have opportunities for staff exchange as well. So this is just for Elixir members. So here, Staff from Elixir nodes can spend time learning new skills in a different Elixir node. Um, we have a so that's the staff exchange project. We have a travel grant scheme where we can support individuals to attend um, external conferences, or we can also invite external experts to come and speak at Elixir conferences. And for example, we've invited individuals from Romania to come to the all hands meeting. That's Elixir's main annual general meeting. And we also have a knowledge exchange scheme, which is focused on transferring knowledge between Elixir nodes and industry as well. And so we've been able to support 26 projects so far through these various staff exchange schemes. And if you want more information, there's a link at the bottom that gives you more examples of these. We're also very active in participating in EU projects. Elixir is a very visible um, initiative. Um, it's got a, a lot of high level visibility and that's, that's helped us get access to a lot of EU projects. And so through that, we're able to bring forward 
experts from Elixir to work in these large international and European consortia. So I'll just mention some of them, but we have about 12 to 15 projects that we're involved in, but these are just individual examples of them, which might be of interest to you. So there's one project at the moment called Elixir Converge, and actually these series of webinars that we're doing with the Romanian community are funded through the Elixir Converge project. And the focus of that is really about trying to build up national capacity and data management. Um, and, and like I say, these events are organized through Elixir Converge, where by being a member of Elixir, then um, partners would take part in the Converge project. There's another project that we coordinate called EOSC Life. This is about trying to implement the life science component of the European Open Science Cloud. So it's a large project of over 24 million, where we try to connect different S3 research infrastructures that generate different um, forms of data. And we help to, to make sure that they go into the European Open Science Cloud. And Jerry later will mention a current opportunity for the Romanian research community through an open call for you um, through EOSC Life. We also coordinate a, a project called Fair Plus, where we work with industry. So this is funded through the Innovat Innovative Medicines Initiative. And really, we're trying to help to make data from industry projects fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, um, so that those data can go into the public domain and be reused by other partners. And we have a really interesting new project, which you'll hear more about in the second webinar, which has a focus on human data, and that's called Beyond One Million Genomes. And this is a project that the European Commission has funded to allow us to help to implement a declaration that has been signed by nearly 25 member states about trying to access a million genomes across borders by 2023. And so we have a project now that is allowing us to help to do the coordination and support the development of infrastructure to make that happen in future. And these are just a, a, an example of the different types of projects that we have in Elixir, which our partners take part in with us on those grants. Um, I thought it was also relevant to mention that, um, and, and Jerry will come back to tell you a bit more about some of the activities that we have in coronavirus, because one of the things that we've seen is that we've been able to mobilize very quickly a lot of COVID-19 related resources across Elixir nodes, and Jerry will show you more about those. But in the EOSC Life project, and also the Converge project, the European Commission has just granted budget increases to Elixir to be able to run um, the COVID-19 data portal. So that's a resource run by Emble EBI. And already we're seeing, and this is really great, we're seeing a lot of data from the Romanian research community being deposited into the COVID-19 portal through these local data hubs. And that's a really good example of the collaboration that can happen um, even without being a member of Elixir. Some of the other things that are open to researchers and that I would encourage you to, to, to um, look out for are a series of webinars that we run. So they include, for example, some of the commission service projects that I was talking about, some of the EU projects that we're involved in. And we also sometimes have guest webinars. So experts from outside Elixir given presentations. We've got two of them coming up in October and November, one about bioschemas this is um, a way to help improve the interoperability of life science resources. And then one about bio curation. So some of Elixir's bio curation efforts as well. And these are open to anyone. So I would encourage you to follow the web link and have a look at future webinars that we've got. And I'll also just finish by mentioning some of the job vacancies that we have. So within Elixir nodes, but also externally as well, we've created a job vacancy portal um, which advertises bioinformatics vacancies. And um, so if you have vacancies in Romanian research institutes and universities that you want to advertise, you can do that through our portal as well. It's free of charge and anyone can upload their, um, their vacancies to that. So it's a good way for you to get extra visibility internationally for some of the, the vacancies that you have. And there's currently between, um, typically between 20 to, to 30 vacancies that are live at any time also including from industry. So that's where I'll finish the talk. Um, I'm happy to take some questions if anyone has some. Um, so for, for maybe, maybe a minute or two, if anyone's got any questions.
Uh, hi, Andy. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's extremely informative. Um, just one quick thing. It seems I can't, when I click on the Q&A uh, and I click on open, I can't enter a question. Is that fine or? Um... Okay, um, maybe Prem knows if this is a common problem or not. Uh, Q&A normally works. Bogdan, yes, that's that's normal. You are a panelist, so panelists oh, okay, cannot, sorry. yeah. Sorry, uh, so my question was related to, uh, in fact, I have two questions, uh, if, if I may. Uh, one is, what is the role of a bioinformatics community in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, pushing this process of becoming a member? Because from what I understand, this is a governmental decision. Yeah, that's correct. That's a good question, Bogdan. So that's right. So ultimately, the Ministry of Science or Education or whichever ministry has responsibility for that area of competence in a country needs to make a decision as to whether they become a member of Elixir or not. Um, and so they usually assess whether they feel the scientific community will benefit from this. In some countries, they prefer to focus on different scientific domains rather than life sciences or within life sciences. They may choose to focus on different areas, like, say, clinical trials rather than bioinformatics. So there's a range of different processes that most countries go through. And I think Yulia in a moment will tell you a bit more about what the Romanian view is. But one of the things that we know is that unless there's a strong coordinated message from the Romanian community of bioinformaticians, it's unlikely that a ministry will ever make the decision to join. And we know that from experience of working with so many countries so far. So it requires support from the government, but also strong push from the Romanian bioinformatics community as well. I think that's a key message. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Okay, there's uh, maybe time... I think in the interests of time, it's 8.23 now. So I'm actually going to um, pass over to or invite Yulia to um, share her slides and to give her presentation now. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Yulia is um, one of the S3 delegates for Romania. So I can think of no one better than to um, explain the process that Romania has for considering whether or not to join SV Research Infrastructures and to give an opinion about what the priorities are for Romania. So, Yulia, over to you, please. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good morning to all our viewers. Uh, I would like first uh, to introduce myself. So, uh, my name is Yulia Mihail. I'm an employee of the Romanian Ministry of Education and Research. And I am working uh, on uh, the in the research uh, part of the ministry at uh, the, our department for EU affairs and international cooperation. When accessing uh, the European Union, one uh, of uh, the obligation uh, was to create in Brussels a liaison office. So uh, that's why on uh, my presentation. So that um, I uh, kindly ask uh, Elixir to put uh, on the screen. Uh, so uh, you will uh, have uh, the logo of our Romanian Office for Science and Technology to the EU based in Brussels. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an engineer in um, physics and uh, I have a degree in semiconductors. I used to work for 10 years uh, in industry, but uh, when the Ministry of uh, Industry was not on the way, let's say, so um, I have had the chance to join the young team that uh, was uh, formed in the Ministry on uh, international cooperation issues. So since uh, then, so uh, 94, I'm working in 93, I'm working in uh, the Ministry uh, of Research that uh, has several uh, names uh, during uh, uh, these uh, years. And the latest one is Ministry of Education and Research. And uh, for the moment, uh, till next year, so I have a mandate here to our liaison Brussels uh, in Brussels. But uh, I also have uh, duties at ministerial level, and um, that's why I'm not only uh, so 
the head of this uh, liaison office, but also a church and one of these uh, EU structures. And one of these is the is ESFI, the European uh, Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructure. And um, so I have joined uh, the team uh, in um, uh, 2011. Uh, and I'm also a member of uh, the implementation group that is a group formed only by national delegates that used to uh, assess um, EU uh, S3 projects. But S3 as such uh, was formed on the behest of the European Council, so uh, the um, the group of the Ministry of uh, Ministers of uh, Research and Innovation uh, with the mandate uh, to support a coherent and strategy-led approach to policy making on research infrastructures in Europe. Also uh, to facilitate the multilateral initiatives, so leading to a better use of development of research infrastructures, but also uh, helping to have this overview on what is happening at European uh, uh, level. Uh, very important was to have a provision, so to, uh, to, to look to the future, and that's why the, the European roadmap for research infrastructure is very important and uh, show a major upgrade uh, on uh, the research infrastructure that are uh, lead at the European level. Um, and also it's important to follow up on the implementation of the ongoing S3 project. And it's one of the tasks of the implementation group where uh, I am a representative or representative of Romania. So this is very important. And um, so the S3 roadmap uh, used to be uh, updated every two years, but now it will be every uh, four years. Uh, yes, next slide in uh, this year, so uh, 2020, um, we prepared the roadmap uh, 2021. And uh, we will have uh, uh, next week uh, the meeting uh, of the forum and we will discuss uh, the new uh, project proposal that uh, we have uh, received. But also we will uh, analyze uh, the research, uh, pan-European research infrastructure that are already on uh, <clears throat> the roadmap uh, 2018. Um, but the document is important because also describe a broader landscape of research infrastructure in uh, Europe. Uh, I have mentioned the link where you can find more about S3. Also, it's important uh, for you to have a look on the working groups of S3 because there are um, thematic working groups. And maybe if you have interest in uh, be in representing uh, uh, Romania in one of these working groups on your uh, behalf as a specialist in a field, uh, so you are free to contact me and uh, I will give you all the information in order to know how, what are the conditions to participate to this working group and to participate to the assessment of the uh, S3 uh, project. So uh, now uh, we are going to the slide with the participation of Romania in S3. Uh, starting with uh, 2007, uh, the year of, and uh, we also have had a representative in the executive board, and uh, we also do have a uh, representative in the S3 working group in environment and um, physics, uh, and the implementation group, of course, myself. Uh, for the new roadmap uh, in the ministry, uh, we have, uh, we know about the Romanian partners. Uh, the DBOH is the one related uh, to uh, public health and is the National Institute of Public Health that participate in this one. EPTRI is about pediatrics 
and we have the University of Medicine of Cluj-Napoca that uh, is a leader of this F uh, pediatric community participating to uh, this uh, project and Euro Nano Lab is about um, white um, chambers, clean chambers and um, the leading institute in uh, Romania is a national uh, research uh, and development institute in bio, in uh, microtechnology. But uh, Romania also have uh, a participation in other uh, episodes. So in the roadmap, you can find 14 of this. And uh, you have, uh, but uh, what I would like to stress is the fact uh, that uh, it is possible to also to be uh, a coordinator of an SP project. And in 2016, so uh, the National uh, Institute for Research and Development uh, Geography uh, took the leadership of a community in. Um, Systems River Delta C uh, and uh, decided to coordinate this infrastructure. And now they have four years, so they are in the preparatory phase and uh, they're going out on. But it's the first ever S3 project coordinated by a EU 13 country. Uh, it seems that uh, for the next um, roadmap, we will have other countries uh, or maybe other one more country uh, from you, certain countries being the coordinators of uh, an SP uh, project. It is not uh, an easy task, but uh, it is possible and we wish them uh, most of the success. So what about the status of the national uh, roadmap uh, in Romania? So in 2008, uh, it was created something that, um, uh, how to say, uh, a small step uh, to be integrated in the EU um, uh, structure. And uh, the first uh, national roadmap, it was uh, issued. So it was, it's a very simple one. So if we are looking to the first document and to the document of today, so we will see the big difference in between how uh, it was at the, uh, that time and how it's now and how complex it is and uh, how important is the EU uh, cooperation, but also the international dimension of the research infrastructure. In uh, 2015, it was launched uh, the ARIS, it's a platform. Uh, it's a platform not only for research infrastructure, but also for research services, for technological services, and for uh, existing equipment. And it's not only for Romanians, so also other countries can register their facilities in this platform. Area. So it, uh, uh, find out if it is useful for your uh, activity. So in 2016, uh, CRIP, so the Romanian Committee for Research Infrastructure, was reshuffled with the mission to update the national roadmap, including Romanian participation in S3 projects. Uh, Andy mentioned so that is important, the community uh, science community uh, our decision in the ministry to uh, look forward uh, including or not a research in, or participating to a research infrastructure so this is very important and it's very important to have this dialogue in between the community and <coughs> A dialogue so to to, uh, to organize the scientific to be the scientific community to be organized in such a way to to show us so they uh, they really can add value to uh, our uh, national strategy uh, being part of uh, uh, European research infrastructure. Um, so 
the next uh, next slide. So, uh, on 15 of September, so last week, we uh, the Christmas changes uh, in uh, the uh, members uh, of the committee, but um, <clears throat> we have um, 11 members. And the president uh, of the committee is a, our former delegate in the S3 executive board, also working for uh, uh, S3 uh, research infrastructure. So it's a person with a lot of experience, but not for, he used to work also in uh, the ministry. So uh, he knows now very well um, what is the from um, so the public. Uh, uh, administrative procedures, but also uh, the SP1, uh, and we hope uh, he will coordinate uh, very well this uh, process of updating uh, the national roadmap. So uh, every uh, our national roadmap now is uh, for a long period, but every three years we have to do this revision of, of the national uh, road. Uh, you, Julia, we also sorry, have, uh, you, people, sorry, Julia. Um, so then, yes. Could I ask you to yes, turn please. your video off, please? Because the connection is sometimes a little bit unstable. It might be your bandwidth. So if you could turn your video off, it might make the audio. Ah, okay, okay, better. yes, Let's yes. Let's try that. And yes. also, just to, just to give you a two-minute warning as well, in terms of timing. Thank you. It is okay like this. That seems better. Yeah. Ah, thank you. So this is quite strange because I'm in the office and we have a quite good uh, internet connection here. Okay. Um, so uh, it is interesting that uh, in the um, uh, committee, we uh, also have uh, members uh, of the research community. And for the first time, we have uh, four universities and only one R and I uh, National uh, Research and Innovation Institute. Uh, even that the research National R and uh, I Institute are more present in S3 projects than universities. So, but that we hope it will be a good uh, anal um, assessment of the roadmap. Um, also, something uh, interesting and uh, important to know is that uh, the status of the national roadmap is a process that um, is uh, follow, uh, um, followed by the European Commission, by DG Regio, because it is done under, uh, with a support, with a support, EU support instrument, the CIPOCA. So in, um, it's an informatic uh, support uh, for the administration. Uh, of the operational uh, program on capacity. And um, it is destined to the public, uh, central public administration. So for the ministries to update uh, their policies and strategies. So next slide. The national uh, roadmap include also evaluation criteria. Uh, it's important for uh, so the bioinformatics, the Romanian bioinformatics community to have in mind this um, uh, evaluation criteria. First is to, uh, so it is not the case now, but uh, we follow the definition uh, for a research infrastructure. We follow the definition done by ESPRI. We are looking for the national relevance, for the scientific relevance, for the feasibility and sustainability, access policy, and socioeconomic relevance. Uh, these criteria are more or less uh, mirroring the criteria that we can find for the national um, project. Uh, so criteria that are mentioned in the national plan for research uh, and innovation. About uh, the panel field, uh, they are not mirroring the S3 uh, panel uh, field, uh, but they are mirroring the fields of smart specialization and uh, the public uh, priority areas mentioned in the national strategy. 
So I hope this is uh, clear enough. Um, and uh, also I would like to mention the European Structural and uh, Investment uh, Fund that plays an important role, at least in Romania, uh, for capacity building uh, and for the construction of the research infrastructure. So that means you can, with the structural funds, you can update your uh, research infrastructure or you can build a new one. Um, but what it is important is that for uh, the for uh, the, the European project is to be part of S3. That's why it's very important also now for Elixir, uh, and we will see how we we proceed in order to have Elixir mentioned in the, this re, uh, revised. Uh, uh, national uh, roadmap. So this is one of our objectives, let's say, and after the, all these three webinars, we uh, maybe it will help also to convince the Creek that it's important to have uh, Elixir mentioned and next year to maybe to, uh, to do the formalities in order to uh, be part of Elixir as observers or a member, we will see. Uh, and now I am giving some examples of uh, how on how we use structural funds in Romania. I have to mention that uh, we are the only one uh, ministry in Romania that have used all their funds under the structural funds. Uh, so we have a very uh, dynamic research community. There are problems, of course. Uh, with the um, IT platforms, uh, with uh, how understanding uh, some requirements, but this is one of uh, the the problem that uh, Commission will try to solve now. Yesterday, during the R and I days, there was a very interesting um, uh, talk session on synergies in between funds, on how to couple EU uh funds uh for the structural funds with the uh, horizon euro funds and national funds and one of um, the targets is this one to make things easier and uh, people not to spend time with uh, administrative procedures but to do uh, research and then another important issue is the fact that using structural funds you have to show that you contribute to the regional development because structural funds are not destined to pay research. So this is very important to have in mind. So structural funds are not paying research activity, but research infrastructure and uh, training of the personnel, so capacity building. Um, so this is also to have in mind. For S3, we have had the raw S3 ERIC. Uh, so it was um, the main instrument to uh, support our Romanian participation uh, in S3. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, for our viewers, for the Romanian ones. So and. Uh, so they are very welcome to uh, our office. Uh, in our office, uh, what we do is also to host uh, uh, meetings of our uh, um, research community on uh, preparing uh, project proposals, uh, reports, and also uh, bilateral uh, meetings. So I hope uh, it was useful, my presentation. And uh, anytime you have my email address and uh, you can uh, write to me if uh, you need more information on S3 research um, infrastructures, uh, but also a framework programs and how to coordinate all these activities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yulia. That was a really a great introduction to to the the view of Romania on S3 projects, and also I. I I agree with what you say about ROST. It's an excellent resource, which I, I know well from my time in Brussels as well. So it's really good. Thank you. Okay, we're only going to have time for one question, and that would be from Catalina Sogor. So please 
um, if you can ask that question. Catalina, you need to unmute yourself. Maybe, maybe she can write down. Yeah, yeah. I think what we'll, what we'll do. There's also going to be time at the end, so if Catalina isn't able to to ask it now. There'll be a panel discussion at the end, or she can write it down, and we can send that on to you as well. So in that case, I think we'll move on now in the interests of time. So the next presentation will be from Balant from Elixir Hungary. Are you you're going to share your own slides, aren't you, Balant? Yes, if, I will. Yep. Yes. If you share your screen, yes. and so. That would be great. Balint will introduce everyone to Elixir Hungary and also to some of the training activities um, that take place across Elixir as well. So over to you, Balint. Thank you very much. Um, I would also like to show as an introduction, uh, Hungary is a rather new partner in the Elixir, although probably not the latest. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, we just came out. <laughs> it's strange for me to see uh, in the opposite direction. We just came out with our first uh, yearly report about our Elixir activities. This is the first one. So uh, uh, it's summarizing what we have done in our first year since we are really uh, full members of the Elixir network and we have all agreements signed. So we have, we, we have one year. Uh, of such activities. But as you can see on my first slide, uh, this process was rather much longer uh, as the first official discussions with Alexia started in 2017. I think Andy, you were there uh, in Budapest on our first meeting. And uh, uh, we had several uh, rounds of discussions and this was already because uh, some of the members of the Hungarian bioinformatic uh, community were really keen on for a couple of years to join all major uh, European bioinformatic networks. And also when Alexia became uh, formally organized, then uh, these researchers started to push very hard the Hungarian administration to, to join these, these efforts. So uh, we had quite some, Discussions. I think this uh, discussion today is uh, somehow parallel to what we we started uh, at the beginning to know better how how LXC works, and then uh, we had to prepare an, an application of, of the node that was evaluated uh, by the board, and uh, after this evaluation, we we submitted uh, the, uh, formally the collaboration agreement that was also discussed several rounds. We got some feedback and finally around 2019, uh, uh, it was signed and we, we, we became full members of, of Elixir. Uh, it was already shown partly, but, but it's very important to understand that uh, Elixir is organized in, in a multi-layer uh, fashion. And I will show a couple of screenshots of the Elixir web pages, some of them are new, some of them are not that new, uh, that are showing how Elixir works and how, for example, my activities as I am the training coordinator for Hungary can be integrated into the whole, in the big picture. So there are a couple of platforms like tools, interoperability, computing and data platform. And of course, one platform is the training platform. So the training platform coordinates all training activities with, uh, around, around the nodes. And beside these platforms, we have communities, and these communities are made of uh, researchers who have come shared interest, and they collaborate together. They might be members of different platforms, and they try to reach some common goals and even make some common applications or develop new tools. Uh, the training platform that I will present you a bit more in detail with some screenshots uh, of the training platform web page is uh, a very large platform. Uh, many, all countries have training activities. And it's very important also to understand that, uh, that these trainings are usually short trainings, uh, short term, like one day, two day, couple of days, maybe a week. 
uh, long trainings that are organized for researchers or for developers. And uh, one of the benefits of the training platform is that we share our training materials, we, we can share our instructors, the trainers, and uh, at the beginning, when you start organizing your national level training activities, it's very important to get some expert uh, help from those who already had these kind of uh, activities before. And the trainers can visit uh, your node either even even before even before you join formally the the Elixir network. But after you are full member of Elixir, definitely you you can get uh, substantial. Uh, have from other trainers from, uh, from other countries. Also, it was very important for us that we could visit uh, many of these trainings and we also uh, received some funding for these visits. So basically how the whole training network works is that uh, there are plenty of trainings, they are coordinated. I would say that a big part of European bioinformatics, the short-term training, short-term courses, are somehow related with them. Uh, since 2015, there were more than 1,000 training events with uh, more than close to 30,000 uh, people who attended to these trainings and, and in many, many countries. Uh, the training network uh, basically has two pillars. Uh, the people who work in this uh, are the trainers, but also these trainers reach the, the users of these infrastructures and uh, the trainers reach also the developers of this infrastructure since all these kind of bioinformatic infrastructures uh, have new people coming in. Of course, there is a train, a local training, but also other, people's, other people would like to, to, uh, to get some novelties how these platforms are working and uh, how they, they should be further developed. Uh, there are three main services offered by the training platform. Maybe you know, or you will definitely look for uh, the most important database for training in Europe is the PES. This is the training registry for the Elixir community. All kinds of trainings are registered here. And you can find out where, uh, in which corner of Europe, uh, a specific training that is uh, interesting for you will be organized and also it's very important that these trainings are usually usually open to everyone uh, LXC members and non lxc members so you can just search for relevant trainings and go and then attend to these trainings there is a training matrix database that it's uh, uh, supervising all these uh, training activities and the third pillar which seems to become very important uh, nowadays with the COVID situation is the e-learning platform, which is coordinated by Slovenia. And on that platform, there are plenty of uh, training materials that you can access uh, already. The current activities of the, of the training platforms uh, within the Converge um, project are focusing on four tasks. Uh, four tasks. The first one is uh, further development of the training toolkit that will that will create a, a more coordinated uh, setup how to um, and standard how to go on with with these trainings uh, all around Europe. Uh, the second is to perform a, a gap analysis and define and and develop new training materials that are probably missing from the from the whole pipeline and to deliver this training, trainings. Uh, the third task is uh, maintaining and further develop, uh, development of the training infrastructure, which is somehow related with the tests, with the databases behind. Uh, this is not very, so this is the word behind, behind uh, what maybe it's not that, uh, uh, it's not that easily seen. And the fourth one is the training capacity building. And this is really very interesting since all all people who are giving quality trainings are probably, they probably need some kind of uh, um, initiation in how to deliver a high quality training. And uh, we organized train the trainer events. We already had one in Hungary. We will have hopefully next year a second one. But those people who are not coming from a teaching, teaching background, but probably from a research or, or informatic background, they should uh, be trained 
how to deliver very good trainings. And uh, I think this is really very important and it works very well. Uh, all these activities are coordinated, all these four tasks are coordinated in order to uh, generate more mature courses or new courses. As the whole uh, vision behind is that, of course, anyone can have an initial training, but this training should be repeatable, st standardized, well managed, and at the end, it should be sustainable in order to, and even self sustainable in order to, to keep the whole training uh, network in Europe. Uh, uh, very active uh, later also. So this is a whole ecosystem of training. Uh, we have uh, the toolkits, we have uh, demonstrator projects, capacity building, national strategies, and then uh, all these developments like the test, the fair plus, uh, connections with the industry, and um, training of the trainers. All these are creating a training ecosystem that is really um, it seems also to everyone that it's very active and self-sustainable. All these uh, training activities are coordinated currently by, uh, so the training platform is coordinated by three very active people, Celia in the Netherlands, Fotis uh, in Greece, and Pascal, who is in the hub, and uh, uh, they are coordinating all these uh, background activities. Basically, if you join Elixir, uh, you will, you will receive plenty of new information, how you can join these uh, platforms, how you can join these activities and how you can contribute to further development of these activities. Uh, this is the description of the work packages. Fotis is in Greece. Brane Leskosek is in Slovenia, also very active. He is uh, supervising the, the uh, online platform, the, the, uh, the online courses, Jessica in Sweden and Fotis again uh, uh, in, in Greece. Uh, one of uh, the result of these activities was a, a paper published last year, about, or it was, no, it was published this year. It was published uh, recently about um, the, the framework to assess the quality and the impact of divine informatics training uh, across LXA Europe and um, training coordinators became also um, co-authors of this paper, which is really reviewing how these whole activities are going on and how this uh, how bioinformatic training can be made uh, better uh, and more effective. So once again, back to Hungary, I will just show you a couple of uh, pictures about uh, our activities and some data just uh, as an example. So basically, this was our first board. Jörfi Bonaj is the head of Node, uh, and we were four people in the, in the national board. Uh, now there is a change. Um, we have 12 institutions. This is a picture from the report I just showed you previously. Uh, we have 12 institutions uh, uh, in the network, and the team behind uh, is made of uh, seven people. Bonaj Jörfi is the head of Node. And we have uh, two technical coordinators, two training coordinators, and uh, two administrative persons. Of course, we are mainly researchers, so all people are doing all other activities, and even the administrative people are doing other activities, so they are not fully employed by for the LXC projects, but all of these people are very actively contributing to the LXC activities. And indeed, you need uh, a dedicated team who is responsible for coordinating the national level activities and also uh, are ready to put quite some effort into these activities. So what kind of activities we had uh, during these uh, years here in Hungary? We had an RNA-seq workshop, Galaxy uh, workshops. Um, we organized uh, software carpentry workshops for uh, uh, researchers who need some initiation in bioinformatics. Then last year we had uh, the train the trainer meeting where uh, we engaged people who would like to train bioinformatics. Uh, we had an overview of the training uh, activities within, uh, within the LXC network. And this year we organized our activities in a so-called data intensive and open science school where we have uh, mainly PhD students and uh, junior researchers who are learning R, Galaxy, Unix, Software Carpentry, and we had our uh, data management and data stewardship course uh, in August. 
So this was the Avalanche Seek uh, course uh, in 2018, January, with a practical part and lectures. Then we have we had the the Galaxy. Uh, th these were all in Hungarian. No, not all. But majority of these were in Hungarian. Some of these were in English. Um, and for example, the software carpentry course uh, where we received help from uh, the software carpentry people that was in English, many attendants, and um, we had some helpers who came here. Fotis was here also, uh, Marco Chiappelli from Italy. It was a very effective course. Uh, then last year we had a trainer trainer where we received help from the EBI with the trainers from, from the EBI and the, uh, the people who are planning to become trainers attended to this course. And uh, this, this uh, August, we had the first data management and data stewardship intro uh, with mainly PhD students, and we will repeat this also later. Uh, what is also very important to understand is that uh, a, re a young researchers, PhD students, uh, um, would like to have their trainings mainly in their native language, so in Hungarian here, probably in Romanian, in Romania. Uh, still, I think it's very important to have at least periodically trainings in English uh, because in, uh, this way people from other countries can join and this can also help the re regional development of uh, the collaborations. So we will have this semester, hopefully, or depending on the COVID situation, maybe next semester, uh, data stewardship uh, and, uh, and our introductory courses here in Debrecen, and Hungary. And we would like to invite uh, also people from Romania. And next year, we also plan to have either online or uh, locally in Budapest, a trainer trainer course. We would like to invite also some people from Romania. So basically, what we are doing now, and we are focusing very strongly, it's the it's the uh, this data intensive and open science school for PhD students, where uh, they are reviewing genomic proteomics. Uh, 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 experimental models, then data analysis and soft skills, data management, which hopefully will help them to become uh, successful scientists. And in order, if you really want to build a community for uh, bioinformaticians, uh, I highly recommend you this paper that was also published by people involved in Elixir about uh, this is a quick guide for building successful bioinformatics community with some clear rules. So um, just read over these uh, rules. It's very important to have an open community, clear communication, uh, to have a benefit of being part of the community, um, and um, to have clear goals, what, uh, what the community want, wants to reach. And it's very, very important to have clear communication and transparent uh, work, because this is how people will feel that it's easy to, to join these activities. So this was my presentation, sorry for, I don't think I was late, but uh, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Balint. That was great. It was a really good, good summary of Elixir Hungary, of your training activities. And it was also a really nice point to finish with about some tips on building a community, because that's really what this is about, helping Roman, Romanian researchers build a, a community around themselves. So that was great. Um, I'm just going to check now to see if we have questions. Um, in the Q&A. It doesn't look like we've got any formal questions at the moment, or not that I can see. Okay, we have. So um, I'm going to read this out. This is from um, Anka Kostash. Good morning. Very useful presentations. Could you please go into more detail with regard to who, I, who has access to training? You mentioned trainings in English for Elixir Hungary. Is it, always, is it also available for non-Elixir members across national? So hopefully I've summarized um, Anka's question. Um, if you would like to answer that now, please, Balint. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, usually um, these trainings are partially funded by Elixir, if they are. Uh, but uh, what is very important to understand is that uh, Elixir is more helping you in coordinating and organizing these courses, but not financially. Of course, in some cases, you can get uh, funds for, for traveling of the trainers, which is very important, or their accommodation. But, but um, still, these courses are organized locally. And the responsibility of organizing a course is a local responsibility. So you have to have 
place where you organize, you have to have the infrastructure, the background, and of course, met quite some people who, who are doing this uh, job behind. LXE will help you in uh, partially in, in funding of the trainers and um, and we'll help you in providing the the um, the training material which means that if these courses are for free uh, because uh, they are funded from other grants then it, it should be for free for everyone or if there are uh, if there is a fee then usually the fee is the same for everyone it doesn't depend whether you are uh, coming from an elixir country or not an elixir country uh, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but usually these are, it might happen that there is a low cost, uh, depending on the national standards. Uh, until now, all our courses were free because we had some local funding for organizing these courses. And in this case, the, they, they will be free for everyone. If there is a fee, then usually these fees are on a national level. So uh, in the UK, I know that maybe it's 50, 50 pounds. Uh, in Germany, it's maybe hundred, couple of hundreds of euros. It depends on the local standards. Mm -hmm. That's great. So that was a really good question and it was a nice clear answer clarifying that balance. So thank you. We're going to close the first session of the webinar now. We're going to take a short coffee break um, where you will make your own coffee um, and then come back at 11.15 um, for the second part where you'll hear more examples of Elixir nodes and other opportunities to engage. Andre, um, over to you. So just to introduce you, um, for, for those people that, that missed the beginning of the first session, then we're, we're restarting the second part of the webinar now. And um, Andre is um, an expert in EU structural funds and has been part of Elixir Czech Republic since it formed. So he will be able to give you a perspective of, of using EU structural funds to help build national communities of research infrastructures. So over to you, Andre. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to greet you from Brno, from the Czech Republic. Uh, maybe just a small introduction to the Czech note as well. Uh, the Elixir Czech has been uh, one of the founding countries of Elixir uh, back in, uh, was it 2013, 2014? So we have quite a long history uh, within Elixir and uh, we have been receiving also quite nice and generous support from different funding sources. Uh, I come from CETEC, which is a research institute based in Brno, and it's one of the 14, uh, uh, 14 partners of the Elixir Czech Consortium. And Andy asked me to share a bit of experience and uh, with structural funds not only on the general level, but mainly on the practical level, how the Czech node benefited from uh, structural funds. Uh, to start with, I will uh, give you a bit of uh, context, uh, which is actually, and um, I was uh, a bit surprised, uh, similar to, to the Romanian case, which was presented by Julia uh, earlier today. Uh, and uh, so talking about funding of research infrastructures in the Czech Republic, I think in, uh, that we are in a quite fortunate situation uh, that the funding system for research infrastructures in the Czech Republic is uh, well set up and uh, it provides uh, flexibility and at the same time stability. And there are actually two major funding sources of research infrastructures in the Czech Republic. Uh, one funding source uh, which comes from the state budget uh, is covering the operational costs of the research infrastructures. Uh, by that I mean uh, salaries, travel, uh, trainings and so on. Uh, and the second stream of funding is the investment costs. In case of Elixir mainly uh, hardware, uh, software and some uh, equipment. Uh, and the investments are covered by structural funds. So th this is, in essence, let's say, the, the notion uh, behind the funding of research infrastructures in the Czech Republic. Of course, the, the teams which participate in the research infrastructures are also welcome to uh, join other grants, uh, ask for uh, other types of funding on the Czech and national, uh, also uh, European level. But this, is, uh, uh, this funding uh, is safeguarded for the uh, infrastructures which are listed on the Czech roadmap for research infrastructures. 
So it's quite important uh, in the Czech Republic to be listed on the roadmap. On one hand, to uh, be eligible that uh, well, we get the ministry support to join Alex here formally, but also to get this special uh, ring fence funding for the research infrastructures. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so coming to the structural funds, uh, uh, there, there's a long history to that, but I just want to mention two, uh, actually three case examples, uh, two examples of the national funding that Alexir Czech received in the last couple of years, and then uh, one example of a cross-border project that uh, we have implemented in the uh, in CETEC. Uh, so the first example comes from 2016 when the Ministry of Research and Education, which is in charge of funding research infrastructures, uh, both for operations and for the investments, uh, announced a call for research infrastructures. Uh, it was a dedicated call, so ring-fenced funding and only those research infrastructures listed on the Czech roadmap were eligible to uh, submit proposals. So this is a uh, well, a bit more comfortable situation than in normal calls. Uh, and the funding which was available was to cover uh, basically two activities. The first, activities, uh, first activity was investment costs for the years 2016 to 2019. And uh, also operational funding for so-called in-house research. Uh, this means research which is connected to the research infrastructure, typically sort of uh, pushing forward some of the uh, tools or databases uh, into a fully open access, fully fair uh, operations. The conditions of the, of the call were so that uh, there can be only one project per research infrastructure. So let's say the whole consortium, in our case 14 partners, had to agree how to share the project and who would be the beneficiaries. And uh, the, the good thing uh, at the time was that there was sufficient funding to cover all the financial needs. Because the ministry, based on the regular evaluation of research infrastructures, knew what are the financial demands of the individual research infrastructures. And based on these demands, uh, it has uh, put together the budget for the call. Uh, what, what has to be said uh, also, uh, there are some co-funding requirements in structural funds. In this case, the co-funding uh, was 5%, and uh, which means that 5% of the project budget had to come from other sources of the project partners. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Alex CZ, of course, uh, submitted a project and it got awarded uh, a budget of some 3 million euros, 2 million for hardware, 1 million for the uh, in-house research, and the project just finished at the beginning of, uh, of the COVID crisis, actually. Uh, based on the discussion, which was internal to the consortium, not all the partners participated in the project but uh, it was a consensus of the whole consortium who is going to be funded and how the funding is distributed. For example, for the uh, hardware component, uh, it was uh, two partners from the consortium who run uh, the hardware on behalf of the uh, other partners. So basically, let's say those who want to uh, have a, their database or tool uh, being implemented in a professional manner on professional hardware, they could easily uh, agree with those two partners and transfer uh, their operations onto the hardware, uh, which is secured by the other partners. So this, uh, this is the first case example. And if I can ask for a second slide or next slide. Uh, uh, the, other call from the ministry uh, was published in 2019. And as you can see, there's quite a, well, a straightforward planning in terms of timing, uh, which is consistent uh, uh, across the board. Uh, so there's quite good predictability about the funding which will be available uh, for the research infrastructures in general, not only to Alex here. Uh, 
the second call was not the same as the first one. Uh, there were a couple of uh, couple of differences. The first big difference was that uh, it was uh, only for covering investment costs. So not anymore any soft or operational funding, only investment costs. And uh, contrary to the previous call, uh, there were n there was not enough budgets to co cover all the needs of the research infrastructures. So this time it was really selective call. Uh, where some of the infrastructures uh, were not successful, some of the infrastructures had to cut their budgets, and uh, well, some of the infrastructures were happy enough to uh, get the full support. Again, there was the 5% co-funding requirement. Uh, and can I ask for the next slide? Uh, this time, uh, the project uh, awarded was about 1 million uh, euros. And uh, the project is running from the beginning of the year until the end of 2022. Uh, and this time it's because it's uh, the investment uh, project, so funding only hardware and software. Uh, there are only three partners receiving funding from the project, but the other partners are benefiting from uh, having the uh, newly acquired hardware and software available for the whole uh, consortium. So this is, these were two examples of uh, calls and successful projects that were implemented by Elixir Czech. And uh, let me go to the third uh, example uh, on the next slide. Uh, it's a cross-border project uh, between uh, Czech Republic and Austria. It's funded from uh, the so-called so Interreg program, which is part of the structural funds. And actually, uh, every EU member state has uh, these cross-border programs uh, with the bordering countries around. So for example, the Czech Republic is bordering Germany, Poland, Slovakia, and Austria. And with all of these countries, there are these cross-border pro programs that are funding uh, cross-border cooperation. And in most cases, uh, since very recently, uh, these cross-border projects are focused also on research and innovation uh, activities. Uh, this project was not submitted uh, under the Elixir umbrella, but it, uh, it's a joint project between uh, CETEC, a research infrastructure uh, and research institute based in Brno, and Vienna Biocenter Core Facilities, which are based in Vienna. And uh, the project is about uh, cooperation in the field of research infrastructures in general on the institute level. And uh, of course, it covers also the, uh, uh, the era of bioinformatics. So there were a number of trainings which were performed uh, within this project. We also delivered new services to our facilities, basically meaning new service offer. Uh, that uh, can be uh, presented to potential customers on the Czech and Austrian side. And uh, well, budget of this project was 1.3 million euros. Uh, of course, not, of that, uh, not all of that funding going for bioinformatics and it was a three-year project. So this is, uh, well, the last case example. And if I can ask for the next slide, uh, just to give you an overview uh, for the Interreg, there are not only these cross-border uh, programs, but uh, there are also uh, transnational programs uh, where uh, there are certain areas of Europe, uh, uh, such as Central Europe or the Danube region, uh, which is the one relevant to Romania, where uh, partners from different countries within these regions are invited to submit project uh, proposals. And uh, typically uh, these are intended also to uh, stimulate uh, cross-border and regional innovation. So by this uh, sort of uh, expose of several case studies, how the structural funds can be used to the benefit of uh, of uh, Elixir notes, I would like to conclude and uh, I'm also happy to answer any questions if there are. Thank you, Andre. 
Um, it was a really, really good summary of the, the opportunities that Elixir Check has had to fund investments through structural funds. Um, I can't see any questions in the Q&A function and I can't see any raised hands either, but I would like to ask one question before we move on to Jerry's talk. And in a way, this comes back to a point Yulia made in her first presentation about how if you want to be successful in accessing structural funds to help build local national infrastructures, you need to have references to that infrastructure in the operating programs. So can you say how you went about doing this in the Czech Republic for CTEC and, and so on? How, how did you go about making sure that those developing the national plans knew about the importance of Elixir Czech and your institution? Well, actually, in our case, uh, I would say we are quite fortunate that the ministry has a very uh, open and pragmatic approach and also strategic approach. Uh, which is true for the, let's say, the whole area of research infrastructures. So uh, basically, it's uh, uh, actually there are two parts of the ministry who are dealing with uh, research infrastructures. One part uh, of the ministry is the one who is responsible for uh, preparing the national roadmap for research infrastructures and for the funding from the state budget. And then there's another part of the ministry uh, which is fully responsible for implementing the structural plans. And there needs to be very good coordination between these two parts. And there needs to be a sort of clear guidance from the community, not only uh, Elixir, but uh, also overall the research infrastructures to uh, sort of coach the ministry and explain them the importance uh, of research infrastructures, and that it's very wise to uh, well have a funding program uh, for them uh, funded by structural funds, for example. Because at the end of the day, it's about uh, having a very strategic thinking about uh, what are the needs of the community, which typically comes from the road mapping process, where the ministry has quite clear understanding which infrastructures are mature enough and which shall be supported and put on the roadmap. And then the ministry is able to work with them strategically in order to see what are the needs of those infrastructures in terms of, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, which scientific fields and which priorities they want to serve. And on the other hand, let's say, what are their needs in terms of uh, funding? And it's never a golden plate uh, where one has a lot of wishes and all the wishes come true, but one has to uh, give proper arguments why the funding is needed and what level of funding is needed. Perfect, okay, thanks. So there, there's, uh, just to summarize, there's quite uh, a need to establish strategic communication with the, with the ministry uh, in the long term. It's a good, clear message. Excellent. Thank you, Andre. Okay, so we move on in the agenda now. So the next talk will be given by Jerry Lanfear, Elixir's CTO. And I'll just introduce him as he shares his slides. And he will be telling you a bit more about all of the scientific opportunities for engagement. So even if Romania doesn't become a member of Elixir, or even if it takes a long time, there are still some opportunities that exist right now. And Jerry's going to talk a bit more about some of those to you. So over to you, please, Jerry. Thanks, Andy. Can you hear me? Yes. I need to see my slides. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about where you can engage with Elixir. Um, in my mind, and I should say that this is, this is not going to be an exhaustive talk. I've got about 15 minutes, so it's going to be a summary, an overview, just to get, get, give people an idea where to start, really. Um, in my mind, uh, there are two sort of broad ways in which uh, people can engage in Elixir. The first is via participation. And across on this slide here, you can see the three main areas that we have whereby people can participate in Elixir. So that's our platforms, our communities, and our focus groups. And I'll tell you each, uh, I'll tell you about a little bit about each of those and how, how uh, Romania is able to participate. And then second is through utilisation of the services that Elixir offers. And again, I'll tell you a little bit more about how that, how that works and how you, can, how you can use those services. 
So if we look at the, the platforms first, so the platforms are our, essentially how we build the infrastructure for Elixir and bioinformatics across, across Europe. Um, we have five platforms, so that's data, tools, compute, interoperability and training. And you can, you can see them listed here in, in, in the figure on, on the left. We have, in each platform, we have uh, three leaders um, drawn from the nodes. Uh, and as might be expected, they are domain experts, well-recognized domain experts around those different uh, uh, platforms. Uh, I'll just mention in the trading platform, we have a vacancy and that's why we only have uh, two leads in, in that area at the moment. We're in the, in the process of appointing somebody. Um, and the, the purpose of the platforms really is, is, is twofold. It's to provide a mechanism for long-term strategies across those, across those domains, um, but also to help build those capabilities across and within the nodes. Um, and so that's a major component of, of, of why these leaders get involved in those platforms is to help build that capability within their own nodes and then across the nodes, partnering with people that work in those platforms from a from across the whole of Elixir. I should say that this is the one area that's not open to non-members, so you can't, you can't really participate in the platforms as a non-member, uh, but of course the, what you can do is utilise the services that the platforms uh, and the infrastructure that those platforms build, and I'll come back to that in a few slides. Uh, the, these areas are funded directly via Elixir, um, to, to encourage and enable working across nodes and, and build capability within those domains. So that's the platforms. Um, if we move on to the communities, the community is really about how we connect that infrastructure with the broad life science research community. So across, across Europe, it is estimated there are some 500,000 people working in, in life science research and our, 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 the communities it is the way that we try to start to connect with that very wide community of, of, of researchers that would like to use the uh, Elixir infrastructure. Again, formed around domain experts. Um, we have 11 um, communities. Each of them have three leads, just like the platforms, drawn from our nodes. However, um, these are open to participation from non-Elixir partners, and we do have uh, non-Elixir members that participate in some of our communities. Um, they can't be funded by those communities, but they can participate and contribute. Um, we, th these are particularly good for Elixir because they provide a mechanism for long-term collaborations with other ESFRIs, and, and that is being established and other large-scale initiatives. Um, they don't, the communities don't just consume the infrastructure that the platforms develop. They also help drive the developments in those platforms so that there's a, there's a two-way conversation between the communities and the platforms so that hopefully the platforms are aligned with that, that wide research, the needs of that wide research community. Um, quite commonly within these communities, they're developing uh, standards, community standards um, that are critical for that particular area of science. And I, 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 would, I would think that you'll hear something about this in session three um, when you hear about the plants community, so they've been very active building standards around uh, plant phenotyping data. And again, these are funded via Elixir, so we do provide um, funds to allow these communities to meet and build capability that links their, perhaps links their standards into the wider infrastructure, that, that type of project. And then finally, the, the, the third main area that we currently have of, of participation is via a relatively new mechanism that we've only established this year and that's the uh, Elixir focus groups which um, offer a, a, a really quite agile mechanism for building networks and collaborating across and beyond Elixir. So uh, to give you an idea, so to, to, to set it to, to come up with the idea and establish and have a fully functioning Elixir community does take us to 12 to 18 months. It's, it's a process that we go through to make sure there's the the engagement and, and capability across our, our, our nodes to be able to uh, succeed in that area. Um, for focus groups, we can put a focus group can be established in in, in sort of one to two weeks. If there's if there's a drive to do it, then then that's that's the sort of time frame. So it's really quite agile. And in fact, I, I put this slide together just last week, and it's already out of date because we have a, a new focus group. It should be listed on the right there around uh, fair training. 
Again, it, it draws on domain experts across our nodes and you can participate if you are not an Elixir partner. So we have, um, I, mean, I, I lead the biodiversity focus group and we have non-Elixir partners involved in that, in that biodiversity uh, group. Um, it, it provides another mechanism for open collaboration. That's why we do it really to bring people from the nodes together to be very focused in a particular area. It may be that you don't engage in Elixir until there's this focus group that allows you to talk to other people from, from other nodes. Um, oftentimes they're, they're, they're providing alignment for publications or, or often grant proposal submissions. Um, some of these may over time progress to be communities but that is by no means um, guaranteed and, and there may be no need to create a community for some of these focus groups. And these are not funded via Elixir, so these are, um, Elixir um, doesn't provide direct funding to these focus groups because they're, 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 they're free to source funding from elsewhere, for instance, via EC grants, if that's applicable. So that's three mechanisms whereby uh, you can uh, participate in some of our organizational structures but of course the other main way I've mentioned about how you can engage is by making use of the Elixir services and the Elixir services are a, quite a complex and extensive ecosystem of different types of services that cover different scientific domains so they're listed there chemical biology genes and genomes etc and of different service types so compute services data resources, interoperability and standards, and so on and so forth. And we conceptualize these services into a framework. Uh, so uh, if we start at the bottom there with the node services. So when a, when a node, when a country joins Elixir and forms a node, part of that joining process includes identifying the, the key services within that node that they will contribute towards the overall Elixir uh, service framework. Um, and nodes typically bring in tens of services, uh, tools and resources and so on from their node to contribute to our, to our service framework. So currently we have hundreds of services from across our nodes sitting in, in, in this part of the framework. Out of those um, uh, node services, um, we have been identifying uh, what we call key service collections and there are currently three different types of those and I'll mention a couple of them in a, in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. So it's the core data resources, the deposition databases and our interoperability so resources and they go through additional uh, and, and more extensive re external review before they're accepted into those key service collections um, and and they, they number some tens of services, so perhaps it's about 10% of the node services end up in a key service collection. And then finally, we have something called the infrastructure services, which are only just starting. We only have one infrastructure services uh, service at the moment, which is our AAI uh, service. We don't expect there to be any more than about 10 in the fullness of time, um, but these will be operated by the hub and the fundamental for many communities and nodes so that in the, the hub will, will run the, the service ultimately um, but as I said there's only one of those at the moment so that's our that's our service framework and what I'm going to do now is just give you just a few examples of the types of ways that you can types of ways you can utilize those services just 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 by way of exemplars really um, as I said, this is by far and away not an exhaustive list. So in the training domain, um, let's say you need to find training courses or materials, or indeed you have uh, training courses or materials for services of your own that you'd like to deposit and store somewhere centrally. Well, you can use the Elixir Tests platform. So this is our um, training portal enables you to search and share and package training resources and training materials and events in a centralized way. Um, this service is led by Elixir UK. You see the, uh, the URL there. It's quite very straightforward to simply you know, search for a, a topic or a domain or a particular service. Um, and there are extensive sets of training that's, that, that are linked via this registry. Um, so it's a, a very useful service for when you find a new 
tool a resource to find the training materials. Similarly, if you're looking for a, 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 a bioinformatics tool, Elixir's developed something called Bio.Tools, which is a registry of life science tools and registries. This is, uh, this is far more extensive than the, um, the, the Elixir node services that I mentioned just now. There's some 15,000 tools in here, so from across the whole world, um, not, not, not just Elixir. Um, again, it's a, it's a registry, it has uh, multiple different parameters whereby you can search data type, web tools, etc. Uh, free text search, it's quite sophisticated in the way that you can search and of course you can add your own tools. You do not have to be a member of Elixir to add your tools into bio.tools uh, as a centralised resource and allow other people to find your resources. Um, there's just a, an example there. It includes an integration with a service called Open eBench, which is a sort of quality uh, control and, and, and assessment uh, service operated by our Spanish node that gives you some ideas about um, how, how the performance metrics uh, for each of the services that are, 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 are captured in, in Bio.Tools. Um, so, let's say that you want to find uh, resources and databases so these could be for finding uh, and, and data mining of particular information from particular domains you can access elixir core data resources so this is one of our um, key uh, services that we've identified they've been through an extensive review and selection process uh, these are of fundamental importance to the wider life science community, not just used in Europe, but across the globe. Um, and, and as an example, so for instance, the European Genome Freedom Archive is part of the Elixir infrastructure. You've got others li listed down there on the left. Um, these come from across the Elixir nodes um, and are you know, the, the, the first port of call for finding information that, find, that falls into those domains. Related to those is if you have data that you'd like to deposit, then you can utilize the Elixir deposition database list. So this is, let's say you have microarray data uh, that, you, that scientists has, 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 uh, developed, has produced in a, in a research project, then you can utilize Array Express to um, deposit and archive that da da data on a, in a secure and, and long-term basis. Um, and prevent uh, siloization of that type of data so that it's, it's, it's increasingly fair and usable by the wider scientific community. Um, and talking of fair, we have our recommended interoperability resources, which is a growing set of, again, reviewed and selected resources from across the nodes that help uh, establish connections between those resources. So you see them linked on the right here. We're actually going through an additional call process at the moment. So we're anticipating this set will, will grow. Um, the idea really is these are tools that help you connect different data sets together. So, so, so that's a sort of functional way in which, um, or a technical way in which many of our services uh, are exposed and can be found and used. Um, but uh, we're also thinking about how they can be used in a more functional way and an integrated way uh, within a particular community. And we're, 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 we're working now on something called Elixir service bundles. Um, so these are collections of services that meet a particular requirement, but are not necessarily limited to Elixir services. So Elixir doesn't cover every single possible bioinformatic need. There are you know, good services that sit outside of Elixir that nevertheless can be used by people in particular communities and we, and we might well recommend that they do. Um, you would see service bundles being community focused, but again, not restricted to Elixir communities. In fact, the example I'm going to give isn't an Elixir community. Um, but the Elixir services within those service bundles will have been reviewed as, and, and selected as part of our Elixir processes. So it, could be a node service or part of an Elixir key service collection. And so really what, what, what would those services do, that would service bundles do, let's say the example here on the sort of in the middle, rare diseases. So red, the service bundle around rare disease will, will 
pull services orthogonal to all of our other classifications. So there will be core data resources in there and deposition databases and recommended interoperability resources and compute services and chemical biology services that together make a package of services that, that start to meet the needs of someone, a researcher in the rare disease domain. And so just the, the, the one example I've got is around something, obviously we put together fairly quickly in response to the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, and that's a service bundle around COVID-19. So these are the elixir, what you see here on this page, which is actually quite long. If you click on the link, when you have a chance and, and, and go and look at it in more detail, you'll see that it's extensive lists of, of, of information regarding COVID-19 service, Elixir services that have, with some context around how, that's, how they are relevant to COVID-19 research. So what you see here is the index for the information on the page. And if we just click again, you'll see just, just an example. So let's say, you know, what database do I need to store data in connection with COVID-19, uh, well, we have our deposition databases, uh, you know, including the raw and consensual virus sequence should be deposited in the ENA. Um, and, and ENA has done extensive work in, in, in helping uh, put services together that, that, that enables that type of data to be more easily loaded into ENA. EMBL EBI is a dedicated page to assist the de deposition sharing of that, that SARS data. They have a help 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 desk type functionality to advise users before submission. Um, then, if you want to access data relevant to COVID nineteen, there's a whole you know set of 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 services that Elixir offers. Again, here we have the the context being added around um, how that relates to uh, SARS related. Uh, type of research. And I won't go into this in any more detail, but there's you know, extensive sets of, of guidance um, relating COVID-19 to the Elixir services. And we think this is a, you know, an emerging and powerful way that Elixir can start to contextualize that complex ecosystem of services that we have for particular users. You may imagine that you'd get service bundles in the future for different domains that may well have the similar services on here that, that COVID does, but, but contextualized in a different way. So that's a, num that, that's a, a range of different uh, options there for utilization of the Elixir services, how you can find data um, and how you can find services that might help you in a particular area. Um, I've got one more um, uh, thing to highlight, which was referred to by Andy earlier. So frequent Elixir is involved in a number of EC projects, uh, quite large EC projects. Commonly those projects include um, calls for proposals um, that can be funded from within that project around particular topics. Um, the, the, we do have one currently open around uh, the, our EOS Life project. Um, there's a call for projects for sharing data, tools and workflows in the cloud and I can point you to the URL there. This is open to, this is not restricted to Elixir members, this is open to uh, any EU member um, and allow you to you know, make proposals uh, with other uh, colleagues in, in these areas if you wish. And, and these, come and, these come and go over time, this, this is not restricted to EOS Life, there'll be others no doubt in the future. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any, any questions if there are any Andy. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Jerry. That was a really great summary. Um, I can't see any outstanding questions in the Q&A function, but, and I think that's because all of the presentations have been really, really clear. But I'll just remind everyone that if you want to raise a hand, um, then you can do that as well. So you do, as an attendee, you do have a function to raise a hand, both now and in the open discussion that we will have shortly um, after Aurea's presentation. But I, I can't see any open questions or any raised hands. So I will ask one um, quick question, Jerry. So you've given a, a really good summary of some of the scientific domains that Elixir works in through the communities and focus groups. Are there any new application areas or domains that Elixir is going to start working on um, that aren't currently included in the communities and focus groups? 
that you might want to highlight to to re the Romanian researchers on the call? Um, so up and coming, we have a number of up and coming uh, communities. So there's we've got one around uh, food um, technology, and we've also got one around toxicology that's that's coming up. So we would expect both of those probably to be approved in the next year. Um, focus groups are much more agile. Um, and um, you, we, as I mentioned, it only takes one to two weeks to set up a focus group. So there aren't any in the direct pipeline, but there, there could be within the next few weeks. It's coming through fairly quickly, new areas that, that people are wanting to group around. Perfect, thank you, Jerry. Okay, so let's move on to the last presentation. So Horia is going to give a, an overview of the work of the Romanian Society of Bioinformatics. And as you mentioned from the beginning, this is a joint event between Elixir and RSBI. So over to you, Horia, uh, to, to please introduce your work and uh, the efforts that you've done so far to help coordination in Romania. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, do you see me? Do you see my presentation? Are you yes. hearing me? Okay. Then uh, I will start uh, uh, first uh, thanking uh, you and uh, all the Elixir staff to organize this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, I uh, strongly hope that uh, the, the final result of this seminar will be um, a, a build-up of a Romanian uh, community uh, <clears throat> focus on uh, bioinformatics. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Horia Banchu, and I am a full professor at the Faculty of Biology and uh, Geology at Babel Bar University of Cluj-Napoca, Romania. And uh, on behalf of the Romanian Society of Bioinformatics, uh, and on behalf, bye bye, uh, my son is leaving for school now. Uh, and on behalf of uh, my colleague, uh, I'm going to. Uh, introduce this uh, association and if you uh, on the need to uh, connect the Romanian bioinformatics uh, infrastructure and human resources to European uh, network. So our association uh, was founded um, last year during March uh, 2019 uh, with the enthusiastic uh, contribution of 11 founding members affiliated to academic uh, and uh, research institute in uh, Romania and uh, uh, UK. Uh, the main aim underlying uh, the activity of our so society was to encourage and drive the effort of uh, building a competitive uh, bioinformatic capacity across Romania. Uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this way, we try to set up uh, two main lines of action. Um, first, the first one is the organizing of uh, a series of seminars called Raw Bio Info Seminars, through which we intended to um, uh, train and develop competencies in bioinformatics uh, with the help of uh, local and international trainers. Uh, mostly our UK colleagues uh, put a great deal of effort in organizing this seminar, uh, and by this way, I acknowledge uh, their, their contribution. Um, this seminar has now reached uh, their eighth edition, um, and uh, the next one uh, will be held on uh, November 4th. Um, on um, antimicrobial resistance. A second series of events employed the public engagement. Uh, the beer and science uh, events aim to bring scientists, academic staff, uh, medical professional uh, uh, together with a uh, wide public member in a environment, in a friendly, in a friendly environment to discuss hot science topic. Uh, by this way, however, um, we and our society kindly invite all the interested uh, people in the uh, Romanian community to get actively involved uh, and organize such seminars and, uh, and public engagement events. So we are open for any suggestion and any initiative, local initiative, to set up 
uh, and continue uh, our idea and eventually to expand uh, the activity uh, of uh, building up the uh, bioinformatic community in, uh, in uh, Romania. Uh, so, um, um, presently the society has about uh, 40 members from uh, academic and research uh, entities across uh, uh, Romania and um, also from uh, Austria, Denmark, Germany and the uh, UK. Moreover, uh, our collaborative, uh, collaborative uh, network uh, or connection was established with uh, member of uh, similar of similar uh, society from uh, Serbia, Ukraine, uh, Poland, France, or, or, or the Netherlands. So presently, um, we clearly need a strong bioinformatic infrastructure and expertise in Romania. So why do we need this? Because it's clear, and also was clear from uh, my previous from, from the previous presentation from my colleagues, that uh, there is no so there are no significant advances in the state of the art uh, uh, human genetics or medicine or biotechnology crop improvement bioconservation discoveries without inputs from bioinformatic analysis. So therefore, uh, the answer to the above question is clearly that the bioinformatics is an essential approach in augmenting Romanian contribution uh, to life and health sciences. So uh, while the need for bioinformatic expertise is well established and it was very nicely demonstrated in, uh, in, uh, my, uh, in the previous uh, uh, presentation, we will further um, state on, uh, on the need or the necessity for a national coordination. And uh, we emphasize that presently there is uh, already an extensive and competitive network of expertise and resources across Europe. So this background uh, need um, um, or this background uh, mean that uh, if to be competitive, the Romanian bioinformatic resources, uh, both human and uh, technology support must be integrated into the extant European net. Um, secondly, uh, we believe that it's crucial to integrate um, or federate the ex existing biological data. Um, and all these biological data are um, continuously provided by, say, uh, research, academic or health entities. Uh, and they need to be put in a kind of a share and standardized system. Uh, for example, the Romanian genome uh, variability could be federated in such way that information become, become available to all users. Um, this will be extremely beneficial in two ways. So first, uh, we believe that, uh, or it is already demonstrated that uh, an integrated system uh, for accessing biological data uh, can provide fast and accurate uh, medical diagnosis. Secondly, um, by this way, uh, the exchanges of information that is already available uh, at a different or at one laboratory and is not known to other laboratory is facilitated. Uh, and this way, uh, we can avoid duplication of uh, results or uh, duplication of research. Um, and then um, uh, by this way, also, we can save time and money. So sharing data means saving time, money, and a lot of human uh, effort. Uh, overall, the national coordination in uh, bioinformatics infrastructure, both uh, expertise and uh, logistics, uh, would uh, benefit of the existing European resources and would save time and uh, money, as I said before, uh, for the um, producer and consumer of uh, biological data altogether. 
So, uh, speaking uh, in another way, um, the Romanian bioinformatic community is still in, in, in its infancy. So, uh, it definitely uh, worth to be uh, helped by the grown-up European network. In the end, uh, we must uh, inform you that uh, our society has started a number of discussion with the official with the uh, official of uh, Romanian government, uh, uh, meaning to identify um, the means by which uh, national coordination in bioinformatics could be achieved. Following the discussion, we were persuaded that the build-up of a preliminary network is critical, it's key. And moreover, um, a clear expression of interest from the Romanian uh, community, both medical and life sciences, researcher or professional or academic staff, is um, it's needed to be shown. It needed to be, um, uh, to be actively shown. So um, one, uh, one leap forward would be the assessment of the need for an integrated bioinformatic network and uh, including uh, this uh, uh, or including bioinformatic uh, infrastructure into the um, uh, res research infrastructure roadmap. And uh, in the end, we actually, uh, this presentation was conceived um, in such a way that would motivate and demonstrate the need to uh, the need to get involved, to get actively involved in building the uh, uh, the capacity for bioinformatics, and also to persuade by uh, by our initiative to persuade the Romanian government to help us and to help um, providing a framework to build this uh, bioinformatic capacity. Um, for those who are interested, uh, they should know that um, uh, the Romanian Society for Bioinformatics um, uh, um, posted uh, a preliminary uh, report on the current status of bioinformatics in Romania. Thank you very much, and uh, please let me know if you have any question. Thank you, Aurea. That was a really, uh, really great summary of, of the, the excellent work that you've done so far to, to start building a strong community, um, both bringing together Romanian researchers in Romania and also Romanian researchers outside as well. So thanks for that talk and for, for the efforts of RSBI so far. And so, thank you too for the opportunity of uh, showing our uh, work and also uh, uh, helping in um, in advertising the importance of uh, building the bioinformatic community in Romania. Yeah, yeah. A, a very important step. Okay, we're going to open to questions now. Now they can be questions to to Aurea or open questions to any of the panelists as well. So in any of the talks that you've heard so far. Um, I, I know that Bogdan does have some questions and I'm going to introduce him in a moment. Um, but just to remind everyone that you can continue to use the Q&A function if you want to write your question down and then I will read out the questions so panelists can answer it or you can, if you're an attendee, you can use the functionality to raise your hand and then if you raise your hand we will unmute you and ask you to, to, um, to speak your question out loud. So just a reminder, you do have this opportunity to, to, to ask questions in the open session. And I know that Bogdan has some, so I'm gonna pass over to you now, Bogdan. Uh, thanks. Uh, I have several questions. First, thank you for all, all the panelists for their talks. And I think this means that we'll take now, it's a great opportunity for us to, to uh, see exactly how we can benefit from Elixir, how we can interact with the European infrastructure, how we can contribute to this, because that, it's, that's a bo both way process. Uh, and going uh, to some specific questions, uh, I would, so I don't know which order, uh, but um, Jerry, I don't know if, uh, going backwards. Uh, what, I have two questions for you. What would be the practical steps for a Romanian scientist to join a community? Is there an email address? Should 
that person just sent an email to Elixir if it's interesting in the community or what she, he should do. And second, uh, say, so let's say that I'm interested in the pipeline to analyze NGS data, genetic data. I, I'm sequencing a, a human genome and I want to process it. Is there such a bundle uh, in the uh, Elixir bundle kits? Uh, I don't know how they are called. Uh, or if there is not, could a Romanian scientist suggest such a bundle of tools? Okay, so the first question is around how, how would someone engage and, and maybe participate in a community? So um, <clears throat> they, each of the communities have their own web page, uh, they have their own mailing list, they have their own meetings. And so I would, what, what you can do is follow the link on my slide around the communities. So that'll take you to the communities page and then you can navigate to the individual pages where it gives guidance on, on how to join. Um, if you run into any problems, uh, you can just hog, uh, just contact the the hub directly, and and, and we'll uh, put you in touch with the the relevant community lead and and so forth. So I, th I think that answers that. Um, the uh, the 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 second part is about are there is there a service bundle around uh, new NGS data? Um, so we don't. What we do have is our Galaxy community that offers the the Galaxy. Um, workflow uh, ser service and, and capability, which is a, a very uh, sophisticated way of um, running distributed workflows across compute networks. Um, and um, they're, they're active in providing those types of uh, workflows um, that, would, that would do exactly what you would need to do. And again, I, I would suggest in the first instance is engaging with that Galaxy community and they could probably start to point you in the right direction. Uh, longer term, you know, if, if there's a, a, a wider service bundle that would be needed um, around a particular topic, um, yes, there's no reason why the uh, Romanian scientists couldn't, you know, partner with, uh, propose and then partner with other nodes to establish service bundles. We see the service bundles coming from the communities. And so, um, you know, our, our hope is that, that these these don't these aren't put together by the hub. We don't have the expertise at the hub in order to do that. These need to arise from the communities. You know, obviously they they, they do require quite a bit of investment. That COVID nineteen example it didn't didn't happen overnight. There was quite a bit of, of research and, and, and effort went into putting that together and, and pulling all the right people in together to to make it happen. That will apply to to uh, other other service bundles I can reflect on within our bioinformatics uh, sorry within, within our biodiversity uh, focus group we're we're moving towards a, a service bundle around biodiversity services and it's it's taking a few months to to identify those services and, and characterize them and sort of classify them put the context for the biodiversity context around them so that it makes sense to someone who who sees that information on a, on a web page so, so the answer to that final part was was yes. Uh, I, I think it, it, Romanian scientists could 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 propose and participate in in building service bundles. So basically, if I am interested in building such a service, if I con can contribute or am just purely interested, I should contact uh, the Elixir uh, Hub, uh, send an email to that address, and things will take will be taken from there. I think in the first instance, that's the probably easiest thing to do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I apologize. I have so many questions. Uh, um, uh, I apologize if I monopolize a little bit the discussion, but feel free to interrupt me whenever you want. Uh, Andre, uh, I don't know if I pronounce correctly the uh, name, Andre. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. So you mentioned uh, several uh, funded projects uh, and that Elixir was involved in them. And my question is, was this an Elixir driven uh, initiative or was uh, or were uh, these initiatives were driven by uh, institutions and uh, uh, how did this process happen? Were, were there like local groups driving these uh, 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 requesting for funding and Elixir joined or with a, a, an Elixir Center approach? Uh, well, for the first two cases, which were the two calls uh, by the structural funds, by the Ministry of Education, it was a central approach. 
And by the time uh, Elixir Czech was uh, very firmly established uh, internally, that means uh, there's, uh, there has been a clear structure uh, then already in terms of, let's say, the, the partners of Elixir. There was a consortium agreement signed uh, by Elixir Czech uh, and actually it's one of the biggest uh, consortia in the research infrastructure business in the Czech Republic. Uh, which creates, uh, well, some difficulties because you have a lot of partners to, to discuss, but having a clear governance for this uh, is, a, is a must, and it, uh, it provides a very clear understanding of what should be done and by whom. And also having uh, a demand from the ministry, or no, no demand, but uh, it was a condition of the call, there's one project per infrastructure, uh, which meant we have to organize internally to uh, submit one proposal. And typically uh, you have a co coordinator of the consortium and uh, either uh, it can be the coordinator to take the lead uh, in the proposal or uh, in the first instance, in the first project, we agreed to have a different partner of the consortium to be the lead in the project. Okay, great, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, that, that's great. So what I'm gonna do now is just move to some questions from the Q&A. So we've had two questions that we've received, um, one related to training from Gabriella. So thank you for that. And that's been answered online. So the question was about um, training for Romanian researchers and Aurea has given more information about some of the local training resources. And just to remind you, Gabriella, that all of the courses that you've seen through the TESS training portal, um, which Balint and Jerry have mentioned, you can look at those as well because right now where travel is difficult, all of those course, most of those um, courses, are, a large part of that registry, sorry, has a lot of online courses which you can still access as well. So as well as local training, you can also look at the registry and it means you can also put in Romanian training courses to the test registry as well. If you want other users in different countries to access your online training, you can do that as well. So hopefully that's answered your question, Gabriella. I'm gonna move now to the question from Peter Hans. I'm gonna paraphrase this question. Um, I would be interested in funding opportunities for early stage proof of concept research that requires sequencing. Um, I might try and answer this question actually rather than passing it on to other panels. So just to explain, we've talked a lot about some of the funding opportunities that are available to partners in Elixir. And obviously the funding is not about doing research because Elixir is a research infrastructure. It's funding for um, trying to coordinate and run bioinformatics services. So although we have projects called commission services, and also we take part in EU projects as well. We don't really make funding available for you to do sequencing. So for, for those types of projects, really you'll need national funding or you'll need research funding from European or international organizations. When, when bioinformaticians join Elixir, then that gives them access to funding to connect their resources that already exist. So I would just try to make clear there the distinction between um, research infrastructure and doing funding that requires sequencing. So of course you can, once you've done your sequencing, we want you to deposit that data into Elixir's deposition databases. Um, you might, you know, you might need training on specific, as specific aspects which you can receive through training as well, but we don't provide funding to do the sequencing. It would be to connect the resources afterwards. Um, hopefully that has answered your question, Peter. Um, but if not, you can you can um, follow on in the Q and A function. So, I think Bogdan uh, had some more questions. Yes, sorry, and uh, I have a question that is directed to Yulia. Hi, Yulia. Are you? Uh, uh, yeah. So this is. Um, it's extremely. So first of all, thank you for participating, and on on behalf of RSBI, uh, we thank the Romanian government for uh, for joining this meeting. It's extremely important to have this dialogue, and it's extremely important for the uh, uh, authorities to communicate to the scientists what are the plans, what is the strategy, and what is the process that we use to reach these strategies. And so related to this, uh, what are the steps that the community should take 
to advocate first the bioinformatics, because we are, as scientists, we are aware that this is important. I don't know if the government is aware. So what are the steps that we should take to advocate bioinformatics for the government? And specifically, what are the st steps that we should take to submit uh, the proposal, the eventual, an eventual proposal to join Elixir to the Romanian government, to, the, uh, to be included in the roadmap? Which are, which, what are the practical steps, if you could inform us on that? Uh, your mic is off, Julia. No, it's okay. Yes. So uh, it is a very useful practical question. So uh, first step, uh, you first steps uh, are already done. That means you are together. You, you are trying to be um, a community. So this is very important because I have mentioned in my presentation uh, criteria in order to be in the roadmap. So if uh, you are in the, so the, the domain and Elixir is mentioned, as I have mentioned when my presentation, Elixir now on the revision of the national roadmap should be mentioned there. I will have a look uh, on um, the text. So there are uh, almost, I think I have also put the link on the national roadmap so there are 23 pages, but uh, there uh, we have to uh, to look where, where to and how to mention Elixir. So what it is important is also you to be well uh, structured and uh, to to show to our uh, politicians. So the, the because of myself uh, myself I am a executive at technical level. So to the politician, to our secretary of state, to our minister, that the domain is relevant, not only for research, but also for the Romanian community. So I'm talking in a friendly way now, and the informal one. So when we have received um, the demand on the behalf of the University of um, Cluj-Napoca, the University of Medicine, to uh, be part of uh, the EPRI, uh, research infrastructure. So it was a dossier very well prepared with um, uh, the community interested and the uh, benefits in uh, order to be part of this research infrastructure. And uh, there was no problem in having uh, the consultative college of our ministry. Usually, it's a Greek one that has to uh, the, do uh, to to do the evaluation, the assessment. Uh, but uh, in this case, as the Greek was not uh, already uh, formed, so uh, we have asked the um, consultative college to give us uh, the okay. It was uh, so that's why it is important to show that it's really important. So and. Uh, it's a, a sustainable uh, project, and um, you have a community that will take uh, use of this uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, if we do have uh, this uh, this this uh, this uh, document, so you can have in our uh, perspective uh, the domain and to allocate funds on a sub program on the life science is part of the national plan. So now it's a good moment also for you, for all the, um, uh, the audience here, is to be part of the consultation that was planned uh, by uh, the funding agency consultation on the future um, strategy on uh, research and innovation. So it's a good moment to also to be part of this uh, process uh, of consultation. Um, and uh, what else? Um, so I think this is more or less you to be organized and uh, also uh, to try to push uh, in uh, the right way in order to have bioinformatics mentioned on the new uh, reshuffled national uh, uh, roadmap and uh, strategy. Great. Thank you, Julia. So um, 
I think what you said here are, yeah, these are the steps that we need to take. We need to build this community and we need to communicate with the government. Uh, what I am unclear still is uh, the practical steps. I, I, I know these cannot be discussed now, uh, but it will be very useful for the community and not only in life sciences, but also in other areas that we are, that this process is very transparent and that we, we, we know exactly what we need to do, at when do we need to do that. For example, uh, to submit uh, the proposal to the Creek Committee. Uh, a a, a, either a format, either a deadline, uh, how should this proposal look like to be, to, to, to fulfill the Romanian government standards? So the, all this information is needed at one point. Uh, when CRIC will start, the 1st of October, so I will let you know how to do it because I suppose uh, they are part of a project, of the EU project, the CIPOCA 27. So they should work in a transparent uh, way. And uh, for sure, we will have uh, more details uh, then. For now, I, they are working on how the methodology on how to work. So starting with the 1st of October, well, myself, I will find out more on how they will input uh, for as a result of the um, uh, national roadmap. That's, that sounds great. And in fact, uh, as we have our last event on the 6th of October or 9th, I think early October, we have the next event, uh, the last event, uh, the last series, uh, the last uh, webinar from this series, uh, we'll be able maybe to go deeper with, with the community, with the participants to go deeper and uh, jointly understand what, how we can answer those criteria. Thank you. Thank you, Aladio. Uh, 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 what I would like, yes, well, what I would like to add is the fact that um, a lot of time researcher scientists, they're presenting their proposal uh, from the scientific point of view. So, uh, how to say, sometimes how to spend the money. <laughs> or, uh, but you need also to show what is good for, for the society. So, because uh, each time when on our side, we have to talk with other ministries or our minister has to go to uh, the ministerial meeting with the prime minister, prime minister. So, they are asking, wow, research. And what you're doing for us. Okay. So always we, you, you have to give this kind of data, useful, practical one, to be understood by everyone. Because that's why it's important to show the relevance, not only for the scientific point of view, but for the society, how this influence in a positive way. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the society is very good. I would like also to uh, ask you maybe after the, uh, we finish uh, this uh, seminar to switch you on the r and I days because under the Hub 1 um, policy, there will be a 45 minutes uh, session on research infrastructure. And I think uh, for all of us that we are participating here, it will be a nice to hear also um, the directions of the commission. Uh, the commission needs to be the research, the individual, the growth. So because now it's to 21, we will join a uh, budget. So we will work on synergies and uh, doing uh, this process of funding research, uh, research infrastructure um, easier, let's say. Because using strong, uh, structural funds is from the administrative point of view is quite difficult, I know. Okay. But maybe the size thing was 21, it will be better. Okay, thank you, Yulia. That's been really helpful. I'm going to need to draw the meeting to a close in a moment. We do have one final question, though, from Marius, which is directed a specific question to you, Yulia. He asks about a consultation or a questionnaire that the Romanian research community has received. And um, he wonders, it was about the identification of European partnerships. And ah, he wonders yes. if this is part of the development of the Romanian roadmap 
and has significance for Elixir? Or is this different and part of the Horizon Europe process? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> So uh, we have to, uh, indeed, uh, we have to select uh, on which uh, European partnership uh, we will uh, manage because this is uh, the problem that we have. So the budget is so limited. Uh, partnerships are not related to research infrastructure. So research infrastructure, we have ESI, European partnership, is about uh, coordinating our policies strategies at European level in a sector. So, for example, the partnership on metrology. So you can imagine that we, at European level, we should act in the same way and coordinate. So this is European partnership. Yep. So this is. Okay, thanks. But please, please participate to this because it's important for us. From now, point of view of the policy, we know this partnership, but we would like also to hear the scientists, what they are thinking about. Yeah, okay. With the, the connection at the end was a little bit difficult, but let me summarize. So Yulia was saying that there's not a direct connection. Um, the partnerships are a different part of Horizon Europe. But despite that, she would still like the Romanian research community to complete that questionnaire. And the, the event that you mentioned for the R&I days, we've added the link to the chat for anyone that wants to register for this. So I am now going to close the meeting. It's, it's now 30 minutes past 12. So I just want to finish by thanking everyone, all of our panelists for their preparations and their presentations and for being able to stay for the panel discussion. And I would like to um, thank all of the attendees for their um, questions um, and their contributions through the chat. We've got a really good idea about where you're based, what your research interests are. And I hope that as many of you as possible are able to join the next webinar on the 29th and the webinar on plant sciences in October as well. So with that, I think we'll now finish the event and hopefully this is the start of a, a future collaboration that will we'll continue over the coming years. So thank you very much. <laughs>